early. Um, some of you are interested in getting continuing education units towards your CFRE. So on the table, you will see, at the registration table, you'll see a half sheet. And maybe you just want this for your board. Um, and it just says, I attended today, what the topic was, where it was, and it's worth an hour's worth of credit for you. If you'd like to get this electronically, um, some of my business cards are there. Just email me, annie at anniefritchner.com, and I'd be glad to send it to you electronically. And I'd rather do that and save some trees. But this will have it every monthly meeting so that you can be able to keep a record of it. It'll be a little bit easier. Um, also, just a reminder, all of you who are um, at the North Carolina, um, who are uh, fundraising consultants and so on, um, your licenses are due in March, so it's time for renewals. And I don't know about organizations if you're on a March deadline or a fall deadline, but just to remember that we're supposed to be registered with the North Carolina Department of Secretary of State Charitable Solicitation Licensing Division, just a reminder on that one. Next month, we're excited. We are going to get enlightened about endowments. And Debbie Patrick is going to be one of our co-presenters. Um, and it's going to be endowments 101 as well as 201. I strongly encourage you to bring a board member, a member from your finance chair, and talk about what your endowment uh, plan is now and how to improve it. We'll also talk about mar marketing and messaging. So it's going to be a complete program. So please come and hear about that. Just put us on recurring schedule on the third Wednesday of every month and you're going to um, catch some great programming. Um, we have an opportunity as a chapter to have Penelope Burke come and speak. Do any of you know who Penelope Burke is? Okay. Um, is this of interest to you if your chapter spends money to sponsor this? And if, oh, yes, no. Yes? Um, okay, it, when her availability would be either the Thursday or the Friday, June 20th or 21st, and our monthly meeting would be the Wednesday the 19th. So we are thinking about sort of canceling our Wednesday meeting in order for people to go to Penelope. How many would be interested in canceling that Wednesday meeting to go to Penelope? And how many would rather have the Wednesday meeting? Okay, great. Thank Ask you. Very, uh huh. Is that going to be open to the community? It, and it is. Our intention in doing that would be to invite the entire Western North Carolina region to come to that. Um, we would like you all to email all of your peeps to get them there. We're looking for a place that would hold two to three hundred people, four hundred people. And what we would do is probably have a couple of fee structures. Um, a fee and then um, for a second member from your organization would be cheaper. And then we'd give a discount to AFP members. So, and we're thinking maybe $25 for the first person, 15 for the second, 20 for a member, 10 for the second kind of thing. I mean, that's... So it's not hugely expensive. It would be a breakfast thing, probably, on the Friday morning. Can you share who she is and what she talks about for those of us yeah, who are ignorant? Sure. Penelope Burke is a researcher. She's dead, she is a fundraising consultant, but she's really dedicated her life to doing research. And her latest work is called Donor-Centered Leadership. And what that is about is she's extremely concerned. She's done um, uh, uh, research with 15,000 volunteers and paid members in our profession and has compiled her research and we are showing an extraordinarily high turnover which is very costly to our organizations and so she has presents her research and some possible solutions it is something as a chapter that we are very concerned about um, because we don't think turnover helps our organizations or helps us as professionals so that's pretty much what she'd be talking about. Okay, great. Well, today's program is very exciting to me. Um, we have an international conference this year, which will be in San Diego. There's a sheet on your there are sheets on your table about it. You can go to afpnet.org to register. Um, and it's on the pricey side. This year is San Diego. Next year is Baltimore. So it will be back in the East Coast next year, April 7th through 9th. We have over 150 sessions, educational sessions, which will be offered. We have major keynote speakers, including the guy who started um, Life is Good. 
Um, he'll be speaking. And um, John Legend, I don't know who he is. He's a musician. You all are younger than I am. Yeah. He might have gotten it's Very canceled. cool. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, guys. great. We love cool. Um, and our Chamberlain Scholar this year is Diane Nelson, who is Director of Development for Hospice of the Carolina Foothills. And so this uh, year we're going to hear, this month we're going to hear from two of our previous Chamberlain Scholarship winners, Donna Ensley with Man of Food Bank and Ashley Lasher with um, uh, Donor Literacy Council, sorry, Literacy Council of Buncombe County. And Donna is going to go first. Okay, we're going to try this microphone. Want to try the microphone? I've got to say, first of all, I didn't think anybody would show up today um, because I figured, well, maybe the weather and also look who's talking. Um, so thank you for being here. Second thing I want to say is, just yesterday I believe it was that Mark sent out an email about um, we're going to be taping this, and I thought, oh, good. <laughs> this is really great. Not only um, are you not necessarily a great speaker, but also now you get to be videotaped. So um, thank you for putting up with me. But before I start talking about what I was going to do, what I was planning to do is share just one of the many sessions I. Um, attended at the AFP International Conference. I want to thank this chapter for allowing me to, to go. It was an incredible, incredible experience. It's one of those things that you, you don't know what you don't know. When I got there um, and saw probably 5,000 people that were from all over the country and indeed outside of our country, because we were in Vancouver, I had kind of no idea um, what I was really getting into. The piece that became kind of frustrating was that this was the course catalog. It's probably about 55 pages filled with all the different courses and the information about the speakers. The hardest part of going to this conference was figuring out which courses I was going to attend. And the courses were uh, outstanding, unbelievably outstanding. So it's um, something that if you kind of thought, well, I can't afford it, I think in the future you might want to think, I can not afford not to go. And the reason I even think that, and I wanted to kind of promote this a little bit, I got to thinking about my life. Um, I'm getting pretty old and I've done a lot of things. But I started off, maybe you know this or maybe you don't, but I, my first part of my life I was a dental hygienist. And I, you know, took all the courses, studied, I took the national exam, I took the region, Northeast regional exam, and then when I moved to North Carolina I had to take the state exam to become a licensed dental hygienist. And every single year I had to have continuing education in order to keep that license up. That still goes on today. The problem with that was that you would learn new things, but the reality in the job was a tooth is clean when a tooth is clean. You can take a good x-ray and it doesn't get any better than when the x-ray that you know how to take. If you take great x-rays, you're going to take them again and again and again. There wasn't any way to use the information that I was learning I could learn statistics, I could learn, it just, it just didn't happen. It's very different in our profession because every time we learn something, that knowledge becomes ours and we can put it to use right away. Fern, I was thinking of one of the most impactful courses I ever took was under, when I was working under Fern, and I took a course called How to Build a Million Dollar Special Event immediately came back and doubled the profits from the year before by just attending one course. So we have the ability in our profession to take what we learn, kind of look at how we can put it to use, pick and choose pieces of it that will work for us, and make our organizations better. But we're also the ones who benefit from that knowledge because you might not stay where you are today, a year from now, 
but everything you learned, you're taking with you. And I started thinking about um, professional development and how I had never really thought that I could afford to go to the international conference. In hindsight, is 2020. The amount of information that is there is like going to a crash course at college, and it's done so well and so professionally, and, and all that knowledge you get to take with you. So I would advocate for each of us to look at our own professional development, look down the road, and if you don't have your CFRE, like I don't, I would imagine that in 10 years, in order to be in development, we're going to be required to have our CFRE to get anywhere with any organization. So consider that, and um, then now I'm going to ask you to put oh, five minutes. Okay. Part 10. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to get rid of this because I can't move all the way over there with this. Okay. The, this is going to be kind of interactive. Um, the, the part of the, uh, what I wanted to bring back was the difference between a movement. Can you all hear me? Okay. The difference between a movement and a campaign. And I, just to get you thinking, this is going to be, I can't spell very well, but I can write. So I want you to, first of all, tell me what you think of when you think of a campaign. Oh, this is Beginning and ending. Okay. Military campaign. Um, right. Beginning, ending, goal. Okay. Budget. Strategy. All right, so I'm hearing... Beginning and ending, a goal, a budget, strategy, timeline, target audience or market, phases. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. Phases. 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 Okay. <clears throat> great. So this is. I mean, we're all. You all are great. So I've got a campaign. It has a beginning. It has an end. It has a goal. It has a budget. You've got a strategy, you know where, how you're going to lay this out. You've got a timeline, and you know the beginning of it and hopefully the end of it. You've got a target audience, perhaps. You've got a target goal. You've got a target project. And it might have phases in that. Okay. This is not very bright. Do you want a marker? Yeah. Okay, does anybody have an idea of what a movement looks like? <laughs> Think of Wall Street, the Wall Street. What does a what does a movement have to it? Organic. Okay, that's good. Advocacy. Advocacy. Grassroots. Grassroots. <clears throat> With grassroots, what else do you get? Passion. 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 I was thinking energy. Committed people and commitment. Yeah, who's going to sleep out in the cold? I mean, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to get you thinking about this. This is this was the challenge that we were given at at this at this course. Now I want you to think about your organization. Think about how it began. If you, if you know the history of your organization. It probably, if it's like most organizations, started with one person or two people who had an idea that something wasn't right. Something needed to be done about that. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. Meet a need. Um, beg pardon? Meet a need. Meet a need, exactly. And that's what, that's great. So that's how we all began. And then, because of the passion, because of the energy, I'm going to just kind of draw a line, kind of got something going. And you got a lot of energy, and a lot of people started kind of coming along and say, yeah, I want to do that. that. That seems like a good thing to do. <coughs> And I'm going to give an example, use the example that they used at, at the conference. 
person's walking along the side of the road, notices that the road has trash on it, and you know, they just don't like, they don't like seeing that trash every time they go past it. So they decide, you know what, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to pick up that trash. This goes on for a week after week after week, and then the next thing you know, somebody comes along and says, what are you doing? And they're saying, well, I'm, I don't like this trash on the side of the road, I'm going to pick it up. And they think, you know, that's a good idea, I don't like that trash either. So they join. And the next thing you know, about three or four people are out there picking up the trash. And then, after, after they start telling their friends, you've got six or eight people, well then what they decide to do is they think, well, you know what, we need to organize this trash pickup. So they start meeting again, and they decide, well, let's go to get a Starbucks and get a cup of coffee and talk about how we're going to organize this trash pickup so we can become more effective in all that we do. So they go to Starbucks, and they start talking, and they start talking, and they're still going out, and then all of a sudden they decide, well, you know, we need to find out who can come and pick up the trash and if they're wearing the right attire because we want to look good at doing this and we want to make sure we're professional and we want to make sure we're following all of the rules and regulations that need to be done. And so then they get organized. <laughs> and all of a sudden they are building their organization but they're not spending as much time picking up the trash they're spending a much more time talking about how they're going to pick up the trash, what kind of trash they want to pick up, what they're going to do with the trash once they pick it up, and how they're going to handle it, and who needs to be involved, and how they're going to get more people involved. And they're not back to the very beginning where they're really focused on how am I going to meet that need. So the challenge in this, in this class that I found myself and we all found ourselves doing was thinking about what is it about our organization or my organization that makes me passionate? How can I get back to the movement? How can I get back to the pieces that are organic, that are grassroots? How can I involve people in my organization in a way that is meaningful to them? Because this, even though we need this in order to be effective and, and to function, this isn't where people engage, for most people engage. Most people engage in the actual hands-on, I'm doing something experience. I know some organizations have the ability, MANA has an incredible ability to use volunteers, but I would encourage us all to look for ways that we can inspire others and use others in our work in a meaningful way so that they can enjoy the same passion that our founders all had to get about doing the work. Let's see, there's one more little piece of my hand. So, um, this is how to build a movement, is to re reconnect with the compulsion or the big idea. You need to be about solving a problem, be part of the solution. You need to be able to provide an achievable outcome um, to get that passion going so that, so that other people can enjoy it. And then, then, after you've gotten all that passion going, all that movement going, then is when you can start really talking effectively about dollars because people will already be so engaged in what you're doing and part of it that that's a natural flow. So that was, that was my She's on a bit of a tight time frame, so we'll be here after the meeting. Hi, thank you for having Jonna and I present today, and thank you even more so for giving us the opportunity to be your Chamberlain Scholars over the past two years. It was an incredible experience. And um, I too, like Donna, when I got Mark's email yesterday, I thought, oh, can't you start filming next month? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but, but truly, thank you so much. Um, I attended the AFP International Conference in 2011, so it's almost two years ago already, in Chicago in March. So we were cold, as Donna was, in Canada. 
Um, if you go to this year's conference in San Diego, you will not have that problem. <laughs> You'll have a wonderful time. Um, but it truly was a fantastic experience, and I want to say thank you for providing that. I think it's a wonderful piece that our chapter can offer our members. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with this Chamberlain Scholarship Program, I encourage you to find out more. Um, it's available to anyone who is a member of our chapter of AFP who has never attended an AFP international conference before. So it's always a transformative experience because, because the conference is so wonderful, but also because you've never been before. Um, it holds so many opportunities, and I met individuals from all over the country at my uh, international conference experience, and what was funny was I was walking through this huge marketplace filled with people who are experts in, their, in our field, and I look across the room and I see Erica Bell, <laughs> who's sitting right back there. Um, so what's so beautiful about it is it's a place for us to go to connect with others, but also to connect with each other and to learn together and grow together. I met folks from smaller towns than Asheville. I met folks from Asheville. And I met many, many people from larger cities than Asheville. And what I found is that there are many universal truths in fundraising, but we all have unique experiences. And so we can talk about these universal truths and share our different approaches, which was one of the really beautiful things about the conference for me. I was also truly inspired by the first keynote speaker at the, that year's event. It was the founder of Tom's Shoes. His name is Blake Mykoski. I'm probably butchering that. He is a fashion icon, a philanthropist, and a general world changer. Um, his speech was so inspirational, and I left that room thinking, if he can make this kind of impact, why can't we? Unfortunately, there were, my flight left during the second keynote speaker, and so I had to miss hearing former President Bill Clinton. But I can only imagine what it would have felt like to be in that same room hearing a highly accomplished and inspirational person. But what really stuck with me, aside from all of that, two years later, were the individual classes that I took. They're taught by experts in our field from around the world, um, and the courses were truly, truly priceless. And the course that I use most often, although I'll have to explain myself once I tell you the course name, <laughs> The course that I use the learnings from most often is called Firing Lousy Board Members. <laughs> now, we all know that um, boards have differing levels of engagement, and we all have moments when, when we think so-and-so is a lousy board member, um, but it's a process to go through to vet your board and to build them into what you think they should be and how they should be providing resources to your organization. And so although I got so much from this session, I will say that I don't go around firing lousy board members all of the time because that's quite simply not my job. But that's one of the things that we learned in the session. And so I would love to share with you some of the little pieces of uh, nuggets of wisdom that I took away from that session. Although I'm sure I will not do it the justice that Simone Joyo, ACFRE, who presented the course, did. But I will butcher it as little as possible. So, one of the things that I'd like to start off when we start talking about this topic with you, if you don't mind, just shout out a few different characteristics of what you think a lousy board member does. Nothing. nothing. <laughs> never shows up. Never shows up. Nothing. Complains. Complains. Doesn't give. Doesn't give. Micromanage. Micromanage. Doesn't follow through. Doesn't follow through. Doesn't show up to events. Doesn't talk about the ministry. Or <laughs> doesn't advocate for your organization. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Is disrespectful to the staff. Obstructive. Obstructive. So we came up with all of these characteristics and more. Someone even raised their hand and said, shows up to board meetings drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think we can all agree. <laughs> when 
be a characteristic of a lousy fortune. <laughs> So we all rallied around these cries of, oh, they're so awful, or these lousy board members, these are all the lousy things they do. And Simone stopped us, and she said, when it comes down to it, boards are responsible for our corporate governance. This means that they set policy, they maintain accountability, and they have fiduciary responsibility. They cannot do this if they're not sitting in the room. So not showing up and doing nothing are pieces of being a lousy board member. We have to have our board members in the room to argue, to have meaningful discussion, to come to conclusions. And so absolutely, characteristics of a lousy board member who does not hold up their end of corporate governance is someone who does not show up for meetings, someone who does not engage in meetings, and we do have to account for personalities. Some people are shy and don't raise their hand or pitch in as much as others. And someone who doesn't prepare ahead of time. But everything else that we just shouted out in this room is ancillary to that piece of corporate governance. And everything else that we just shouted out are characteristics of lousy lead volunteers. And we want our board to be excellent lead volunteers, but we cannot expect them to do so without setting that expectation ahead of time. So without setting any expectations ahead of time, yes, we can hold a board accountable for their corporate governance, for not showing up to meetings, and for not participating in meetings, or being prepared. But showing up drunk to meetings, we may need to say that ahead of time. <laughs> More so than that, we absolutely need to say ahead of time, we expect you to give, we expect you to buy tickets to such and such an event, we expect you to speak with respect to your fellow members of the board and to your staff, and all of these other things that we see as very important characteristics of a board. So, how do we do that? How do we coach board members to be great board members, and great lead volunteers. Well, the first thing is starting with our new baby board members. We have to screen them. And so she gave us the idea of when you're having a get to know you session with a potential board member, don't tell them that you want them to be your board member. Learn about them. Because boy, wouldn't it be awkward to come back later and say, you know, I know I told you we wanted you on our board, but you're just not the right fit. So, so it's very important to start by doing your homework and getting to know the person and finding out what they can give to the organization. And then, once you've decided that this person is a perfect fit, is to communicate all those expectations that we have. And to communicate them verbally and in writing, and to begin a culture on the board that supports these different expectations. And never negotiate these expectations just because the president of the local university has said that they would be on your board, but they just don't have time to fundraise, they're not interested in coming to your event, well, that person's not a great fit for you if those are the expectations that you're setting ahead of time. We have to hold everyone accountable for the same expectations. Next, she said we need to, we as fundraisers, as directors of development, as executive directors, need to become experts in corporate governance and foster those conversations regularly with the board and share with them what is an appropriate dialogue and what is an inappropriate dialogue as it relates to corporate governance. And this is one of my favorite pieces. She said, evaluate each board meeting. Ask the board, did we argue enough? Did we come to a great conclusion? Did you learn what you needed to learn about the organization? What training do you need to become a better board member? And um, I started implementing that myself with a little survey at the, each of every, at the end of each board me meeting. And no board member is allowed to leave the meeting until they hand that survey back to you. <laughs> but they can share in a safe, quiet way feedback from how the meeting went. 
and then I can take all the names off of it and feed that information back to the board and say, this is how you think our last board meeting went. Here are some areas that you think we can improve. And this is another big one. She said we need to appraise board member performance. Quarterly, our board chair or our board development chair to say, how are you doing? How can we help you do better? And annually, the board development committee should sit down and in a confidential way, speak about each board member and compare their performance to these same expectations that were laid out when they agreed to become a board member. And then, of course, who evaluates the board development committee? And she suggested that the board chair and the executive director together evaluate the members of the board development committee. So the last piece, when we finally get down to what this is all about, her title of firing lousy board members, if you've done all of these, if you've taken all of these other steps and you've set expectations and you've shared ideas and roles and you've done your evaluations of meetings and of members and you're still, the coaching doesn't work, what do you do? She said, you know, it's the board's role to enhance the attrition of lousy board members. But it's the executive director's role to enable the board to do so. And it's the development director's role to enable the executive director, to enable the board to do this. Because there needs to be a unified front. So, the next step, and these steps aren't but the next step is for the board chair or the board development chair to share with this lousy board member what concerns they have. Um, they want to do so in a way that is very kind and allows the lousy board member to step back and say, you know what, this isn't the best time for me, it's not the best role for me, maybe I should just resign. And the next words out of the board chair's mouth are so important. And those words are, yes. <laughs> but we would love to keep you engaged and maybe include you in a committee in the future when you have more time. But not to help make excuses to the person and say, oh, well, I know you're so busy right now and I know that you can't show up, but maybe you'll be able to come in a few months. But to say, we accept your resignation. We appreciate your service. We hope we can continue to work with you in the future. Now, sometimes people say, oh, well, I'll do better. I'll do better. I'll show up next month. I'm going to call 10 potential corporate partners, and things will get better. And sometimes they do, and that's wonderful. And then that's a way to coach board members to becoming better volunteers, better members of the community, better members of your team. And sometimes they don't follow. And the next step when they don't follow through is for that same board chair or board development chair to have a face-to-face -face conversation with that person a second time and say, these were the expectations that we laid out when you became a member of our board. We are seeing that you are still struggling with that. We love you, but we have to ask for your resignation. And there's another very important follow-up step to that one, just as there was before for the role of the board chair, board development chair, and that is to keep their lips sealed and to let that board member resign with dignity and to report back to the board, so-and-so has had to submit their resignation, we wish them the best, but to keep the entire process under wraps very nicely. So that, was what I took away from Simone's presentation. Um, she is, was an extremely engaging presenter, and she spoke about four times, five times as long as I did, and I learned probably five times as much as you could have possibly learned from me in these 10 minutes. Um, but I highly recommend giving yourself the opportunity to learn from a professional like Simone at the AFP International Conference. And I do have my notes typed up here. If you would like to take them with you, uh, I'd be happy to leave them on the table up here. 
And if you have any questions about the conference, about particular sessions, feel free to email me, ashley at litcouncil.com, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Something that ties into both presentations that I would love some feedback on is when you have a perhaps a, an overly highly motivated board member or committee member that has these grandiose ideas in which you want to entertain them, but you are you know they are not financially feasible. So how to kind of temper their energy with um, proper direction? That'd be great. So. Um, Donna and I would be happy if anyone else has input into the answers. Please raise your hand um, so we can kind of contribute the answers to this question as a, as a team. Um, what do you think, Donna? Chad, I would say that um, grandiose ideas are great if they're part of your strategic plan and they're part of your mission. But uh, if you don't have a strategic plan in place, then that would be my next first step. And, um, and then and then go from there because otherwise it's really easy for an organization to get off track and of course everything has to go and be married to the mission. That would be my answer. Thank you. And and I'd add one other thing to try to direct the grandiose idea to something that may actually that may that you may actually find very useful. So if it's this idea and it needs to be this idea to try and direct that energy. You know, I was taken by Donna's uh, presentation, and I, I wonder if some nonprofits get off track. They get away from their core mission when they start looking for grant income. And do you think that it has something to, to be concerned about? Personally, yeah. I personally have worked with an organization that absolutely did that. And I, I think um, that one of the key, most important things that a board can do and at a staff meeting, every staff meeting, is to read your mission statement. And, and so that it, it's at the top of the mind, your mind of every decision that is made. Um, it, it creates focus and direction. And um, then maybe that grant that has a lot of money out there great but if it's not going to if, if it's requiring you to do a program that you really had didn't have as again part of your strategic plan it wasn't where you're planning to go and you start chasing the dollars I think that's that's the best way to chase an organization down the road to death um, and and a couple of the thing one thing that um, going back to that that movement piece that again like you this was a this was actually at least a 45 minute if not an hour presentation and one of the um, key he had a video a, a, a couple of like flash mob videos and all these cool videos to watch and really look at you know what does it look like what do people engage in but if, um, the example that was also used was Charity Water. Have you all ever heard of this, of Charity Water? It is an incredible organization that directly is able to link the donor with what their, what their dollars are doing and through video and everything else. And it has just had amazing growth and amazing impact. But it gets, it helps people see what it is that they can do and it's specific. And I, I don't know, I, I was so engaged by this movement piece because I found myself thinking, you know, if we just all oh, could get back to what it is that we're passionate about doing and skip all of that planning stuff, it would happen more organically. Sorry, need that. But yes, stay to the mission. Anybody else? Uh, I'll ask the question of, of Ashley, have you put any of these techniques into practice? Yes. Um, we are actually building our board development committee right now. So I'm utilizing these same learnings in forming um, board contracts, board code of conduct. Um, as I said earlier, using the 
board analysis survey at the end of every board meeting. Um, and I've, I've found that it helps a lot. It helps to shift the culture when you're very clearly communicating what the expectations are. Um, and to have the board even buy into that and self-monitor. Actually, uh, one of the things I've done the past too is have a covenant that they sign. You know, not some, this is the restriction you have, isn't it? But, and also have the staff sign. Mm -hmm. This is what we as a staff will provide. We'll provide up-to-date information about the clock. And, and sign it, and what that does, it just kind of puts a, uh, an intentionality to both the board and the staff to work together. It's a wonderful idea. What's the difference between a covenant and a contract, board? Well, I just thought contract was a little hard, part of the language. A covenant is a difference. Yeah, it is. Yeah, as a church name, you know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it seemed, um, I also want to let you know that um, if you go onto the AFP um, NET.org website and you go under conferences and you can register for the conference, um, but also you can register to speak at the conference if you, uh, 2014, if you are an AFP member, uh, the call for presentations is open. Um, and it helps if you have been a speaker someplace prior to that, but 10% of all the speakers at the International Conference have to be new speakers to that conference. So you have a shot at it. If you present at other places and can give some ratings, that's very helpful. Um, I'm a part of the committee at, um, who plans the International Conference and have been a part of that for a few years now. So we will get them, read them, they're read three times, and then the staff were just to recommend, recommend, whatever you call that. And we just make recommendations to the staff for them to choose. Um, but we are planning Baltimore for next year. So if you're interested, please let me know. Go on the website, take a look at, um, at what the possibilities are. What other questions do we have for our speakers? Because we would love for you to stay and have a conversation. I myself find it absolutely amazing to walk into a room with three or four or five thousand fundraisers. And those of you who have been there understand this. Uh, it kind of makes you want to weep um, because everybody there gets what you do. And there is nothing like that. And, I mean, that's why I come every month is to be with you all is because you get exactly what the problems are and the challenges are. And when you're in a room with, you know, three thousand people, being addressed by Bill Clinton, it's like, oh my God, what we do really does matter. And there are people from all over the world now too, uh, Egypt, South Africa, um, all over. So you get to make, um, meet new friends. I want to say one more thing about that because you know, I've been with MANA for four years. But prior to, to working with MANA, um, I was in small organizations, many of them that had an executive director, development director, and one other staff. and. Often those kinds of that the dollars to go to a conference are not in anyone's budget, um, and so it, it, normally it, what I found at this this conference was I was seeing people from universities, hospitals, major foundations, people that had major budgets to get there, and the quality of every course that I was able to take was what you would expect <laughs> that these folks would demand. Well, to go to Baltimore doesn't take that long to get in the car and drive or whatever. Maybe we ought to have a large group going and get rooms together because that, it's, it would, it's a shame to miss it just because you think you can't afford it. If you look at how you, is it, the knowledge cannot be taken from you. It will be yours for the rest of your life and it can be transformed. Who is thinking about going? I think, Sean, are you going? This oh, year. Alex? Mark is going to go, Debbie Patrick, I'm going, Diane's going. This year or next year? This year. That's right. So, so anyway, we'll share rooms if that helps. <laughs> and next year, for sure, we should get a large contingent. See if we can get some of you speaking in Baltimore. So we'll go cheer you on. Well, let's thank our two speakers. On the <laughs>